Embryo contained by the windy stomach of Boreas, if once will have risen alive to this light, one who can rise above every deed of the heroes with skill, hand, strong body and mind. May it not be a Caesarean section for you, nor aborted without use, not as Agrippa, but born under a good star. Speak the charm of me. There will come a time on the planet Earth when science and technology will be long forgotten. This is the Arnamancy Podcast. The world is weirder than we know. Join your host, Reverend Eric, in his diverse array of amazing guests in an exploration of tarot, magic, the occult, and the history of Western esotericism. The Arnamancy Podcast exists thanks to the support of generous listeners like you. Please consider supporting this podcast for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash arnamancy. Here we are again. Welcome to part seven of this podcast's deep dive into Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy. I am your host and guide, Reverend Eric, and if you are joining us for the first time and would like to catch up on early episodes in this series... You can find them on the podcast's website at arnamancy.com slash agrippa. In previous episodes, we have examined both the structure of occult philosophy and the worldview it attempts to explain. We are finally ready to take a closer look at one of the topics that this massive work is best known for, planetary and astrological magic. Okay, this episode will cover a lot of material from across book two of Occult Philosophy. If you are looking for sections to read before listening to this episode, I would suggest starting with book two, chapter 29, and reading through chapter 50. However, after this episode, I believe you're going to want to spend some serious time studying all of book two, especially going back over the parts about planets and spirits from earlier on. So where do we start with planetary magic? Occult philosophy is filled to the brim with important information on this enormous topic. But I think we can find a few places that outline the specifics. In Book 2, Chapter 59, which I realize now is outside the list of chapters that I suggested you read, Agrippa gives us an excellent starting point when he writes, There are seven governors of the world. As Hermes said, they are Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon. And these are called and invoked with various names and epithets. So this is where we will start. Planetary magic involves working with the traditional planets, their energies, paradigms, and spirits. Planetary magic is about creating ritual relationships with these planets that engages all of the senses, using planetary correspondences such as colors, perfumes, stones, symbols. Anyhow, it engages all of the senses to create magical space that is imaginal, creative, and filled with planetary influence. As we will discover, both planetary and astrological magic cover a wide range of practices that occultists of all varieties are likely familiar with. You will find sigils, prayers, petitions, spirits, and hymns. In fact, this type of magic also leans heavily on occult correspondences, as I mentioned earlier, which can include metals, stones, crystals, herbs, foods, incenses, perfumes, and animals. In other words, all of that strange material 
that was contained in book one. Okay, back to book two, chapter 59. Here, occult philosophy goes into many of the names and epithets associated with the seven governors or planets. Today, of course, we know these governors by their English names, which are primarily taken from Latin. But Agrippa goes further and pulls from ancient sources, including the Orphic hymns. This inclusion of the Orphic hymns is interesting because of their long status as a cornerstone of planetary magic. In modern occultism, they are frequently recommended as excellent openers for petitions to the various planetary deities and are often used in daily practices involving the planetary deities. But if you pay close attention to what Agrippa does with his use of the Orphic hymns, you might notice something interesting. The planets are not just associated with the obvious gods after which they are named. Some have surprising associations. For example, the sun is associated with Kronos, Jupiter, Ares, Helios, and Apollo. Now, Helios and Apollo are not surprising, but Kronos, Jupiter, and Ares, those are surprising. The moon has a less surprising array of characters, but still it's pretty diverse and includes Hecate, Selene, Artemis, and Persephone. Now, two of those, Selene and Artemis, are traditionally associated with the moon, while the others seem, um, I mean, they're lunar, and we know that now, uh, and their lunar aspects, I guess, are pretty ancient and talked about a lot in something like the Greek magic papyri, but I found that association very fascinating. Gaia Martiana, who runs the excellent Sartrix website, also informed me that this chapter, chapter 59, takes material from Liber Orationum Planetarum Septum, or the book of addresses to the seven planets. She has a really interesting article on her website that discusses this fascinating work. Make sure you check the show notes for a link. In this episode, we're going to hear from some astrological magicians. And as we hear from them, you're going to hear the Picatrix mentioned over and over again. In fact, with all of the astral mages that I have talked to, the Picatrix, it seems, is far more popular as a source for astrological and planetary magic. I think this is probably because we have multiple recent excellent English translations of the Picatrix. So it's also my hope that Eric Perdue's translation of Occult Philosophy will encourage more modern magicians to look at Agrippa's work as an important source once more. All right here in the book. One of the cornerstones of planetary and astrological magic is working with planetary spirits. In addition to the pagan deities and epithets listed in chapter 59, book two also has lists of archangels, angels, intelligences, and spirits associated with each of the planets. For example, chapter 22 has the archangel, intelligence, and spirit or daimon of each of the seven planets, in addition to the intelligence of intelligences of the moon and the daimon of daimons of the moon. To learn more about these names, check out the previous episode in this series, which covers planetary spirits and intelligences. Also, you will find many additional planetary spirits and epithets to consider in chapter 58 of book two. It is also necessary for you to understand another important cornerstone of planetary magic that is still used today, and that is the planetary days and hours. We find these also in occult philosophy. They are given a brief but thorough explanation in Book 2, Chapter 34. Planetary hours are really fascinating because they have an unbroken continuity going back possibly to Babylonian astrology, which gives them a lot of power and influence with modern practitioners of this ancient, ancient art. 
So let's talk a little bit about how they're divided. There are basically 24 planetary hours in a day, just as there are 24 modern hours in a day. The daytime hours are taken by dividing the time from sunrise to sunset by 12. And the nighttime hours, of course, sunset to sunrise divided by 12. These are each associated with the planets in Chaldean order. So, for instance, on Saturday, the day of Saturn, we start with the first planetary hour of Saturn and then move onward. Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, the Moon. Gosh, I hope I got that right because I didn't write it down in my notes. Anyhow, you basically just go through them over and over and over again. And oddly enough, uh, the way the Chaldean order works out, the first planetary hour of each day names the planetary day. So for instance, the first planetary hour of Monday is the moon. The first planetary hour of Tuesday is Mars. The first planetary hour of Wednesday is Mercury and so forth. These planetary hours are essential to the sort of timing that is uh, one of the additional core elements of planetary and astrological magic. And this emphasis on precise timing and calculation also brings us to one of the most important parts of Agrippa's magical system. Astrology. You thought I was going to say math, didn't you? All right, it's time to talk about the astrology behind the magic. Now, it's possible to do effective planetary magic relying on just the planetary hours without getting into astrology. But if you really want to take advantage of the system of magic laid out in occult philosophy, you'll need astrology, at least some of it. As Agrippa tells us in Book 2, Chapter 29, in any magical operation... The place, motion, and aspect of the stars and planets in degrees, signs, and qualities are observed. Agrippa goes on to explain that when a planet is in its most proper place and at the right time according to the planetary day and hour, it will be possible for the magician to attract the planet's most appropriate qualities and virtues. The type of astrology that you're going to need in order to do this kind of magic is called electional astrology. Now, there are several different types of astrology. Most people are familiar with natal astrology. That's the examination of the planets, stars, and their relationships at the moment of a person's birth. It's where we get our sun signs from. If you are an Aries, then the sun was in Aries when you were born. But electional astrology is something different, and it's a little bit more predictive. With electional astrology, you plan ahead, and you find a chart that looks good. Basically, you try to find a time when the planets and stars and their relationships are at the right position to help ensure the success of an operation, whether that's magical or mundane. Basically, the planets and their relationships and angles need to match the intent of your magical action, talisman, or operation. Jay Swafford is a skilled astrological magician and the artist behind both the Moonlit Hermit Tarot and the Picatrix Deccans cards. Here's what he has to say about elections for magical talismans. It, it depends on the intention of the of the talisman. So that's that's one of the main uh, purposes of astrological election is to set a time to empower a, a talisman using the planetary uh, influences. And so the first thing to do is to know what your intention is. Uh, and then based on your intention, whatever it is to, to gain wealth or to gain uh, a lover or maybe to hurt somebody or destroy a city or whatever, you attribute that to one of the planets. And then you look at an astrological chart and you try to pick a time in which that planet is either on the ascendant or the 
midheaven on the day and in the hour of that planet and ideally the moon should be waxing and not combust the sun so like right on top of the sun nor should there be uh, any aspects with uh, mars or saturn and ideally the moon and the planet in question should also not have any square or opposition aspects to any other planet uh, depending on on the intention again i have heard one thing from uh, studying this reading like christopher warnock and some other folks that a separating aspect is no big deal once a, once the planet once the aspect starts separating then the influence is much less and so it's much less of a worry and uh, i have heard from folks that mars and saturn need not be wholly ignored or avoided like a, a trine um aspect is is a good thing and and does not negate a positive talisman well that's your job maureen you got what it takes for that kind of stuff oh no you don't what are you trying to do bring radio back again the first step in finding a good election is to uh look at the moon in fact, Agrippa urges us to pay special attention to the moon for every operation because, as the neighbor of the earth, it is the root of the golden chain through which all influences will be directed by the higher planets and stars. It is basically the last stop for divine light before it reaches us. Agrippa also tells us particular situations when the moon is at its most powerful for a particular operation. One of these situations is when the moon is in one of the 28 mansions suitable for your operation. He's talking here about lunar mansions, also known as the mansions of the moon. I will let Jay Swafford explain the lunar mansions. The lunar mansions. So the lunar mansions are uh, divisions of the ecliptic. So the, the path of the moon uh, across the sky um, that has you know, subsequently become the the zodiac of the the twelve signs. Uh, the lunar mansions predate those uh, that twelve sign zodiac. Um, indications it are that it predates that um, by quite a bit. Um, and there are twenty eight lunar mansions that roughly follow uh, the moon each day. So the moon takes about twenty two hours, give or take. It fluctuates uh, to trans. Uh, to transverse each each mansion, so that at the end um, it, it comes back around uh, after 28 days, which is the you know the length of a lunation. So um, a full moon, it'll come around and be uh, not quite in the same spot for the next full moon. It, it goes around. They are indicated by stars, um, the the fixed stars, and uh, each each of them has a name and a, uh, a spirit that is associated with that mansion. Um, and there's been um, some speculation about where they began, and I've seen some written um, arguments that uh, suggest it may be ancient Babylon, maybe ancient China, maybe ancient India. And there's equally good arguments about each one of those, um, but essentially, uh, traditions from those three cultures kind of melded. Um, uh, it also made its way into uh, Arabic cultures, which really uh, took off with the the mansions. And there's a really big uh, tradition in um, Arabic speaking cultures of the mansions of the moon. Um, and each one was given attributions in terms of like what kind of magic was appropriate to perform. During that, when the moon was in that mansion, um, there have been other uh, kind of traditions built up around them about like some being auspicious or inauspicious and things to do or not do for um, best luck and health and stuff in that mansion. Even down to things like wear new clothes, don't know wear new clothes, that kind of thing. And it can range anywhere from 18 hours to like 26, 27 hours. Uh, I believe the Picatrix says that um, the moon's speed in the mansion, if you're doing a talisman for that mansion, that the moon's speed uh, adds 
you know, a wrinkle to the quality of that mansion. So if you want something to happen quickly, you know, you make your talisman when the moon is in a mansion, when it's transiting very quickly through that mansion. So less than 22 hours. When it's on the short end, your thing will happen quickly, or maybe it'll um, dissipate quickly. And then when it's on the long end, things will happen slowly or for a longer term. You can find a complete list of lunar mansions in Book 2, Chapter 33. Each of the mansions has its own name, spirit, and magical images. The names are strange, like Alnoth and Alzarfa. Jay explains where all of these unusual names originated. Uh, generally, they were based on the stars, that in, the indicator stars for them. So um, Almaces, that's the fifth mansion of the moon. Uh, it's in uh, late Taurus and early Gemini. And that, that is the name of a star that, that's in that area. Uh, the Pleiades uh, has a mansion uh, that's the third mansion of the moon uh, called Athariah or Azariah which means many little ones. So it's basically based on uh, those stars as well. In addition to the lunar mansions, occult philosophy focuses on another division of the heavens that may not be familiar to the modern student of astrology, the Deccans. Once again, I shall let Jay explain. So the Deccans, again, similar, similarly as the, uh, the mansions of the moon, the Deccans are divisions of the ecliptic. Uh, but this time, instead of 28 divisions, there are 36. And this is more explicitly based on the 12 signs of the zodiac. Each of the signs of the zodiac is divided into thirds, each, each of them 10 degrees. And so the, each sign of the zodiac being 30 degrees has three in it. So each decan is 10 degrees, hence the name decan. Um, and, the, and each decan has its own attributes. In addition to the sign, their own, their own planetary influence, um, almost independent of what the planetary ruler of the sign is, and um, their own magic purposes. Um, they also apparently have their own spirit names. This is something I've not been too active in, so uh, I've not really tracked those down. So its own set of you know magic to be done in that in that little section of time. One interesting modern practice involving the Deccans is the Deccan walk. Agrippa never mentions the practice, nor does the Picatrix, but it essentially consists of doing regular ritual every time the sun enters a new Deccan. Last year, I attempted a Deccan walk and failed. However, my good friend Andrew B. Watt, whom you have already heard on this series, has been successfully exploring and executing Deccan walks for a while now. He shares both his methods and his results on his website and his Patreon page, and there's a link in the show notes to his amazing catalog of Deccan-related material. You should really make sure to check it out. Also, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you've definitely heard me talk about Deccans before with a variety of guests. I've included links in the show notes to a number of relevant earlier episodes, including interviews with T. Susan Chang, Josh Proto, and Ryan Butler. As you read through Book 2, you will come to realize that Agrippa lays out many rules for the creation of astrological talismans based on precise astrological elections. In particular, chapters 29 and 30 of Book 2 contain the most important rules for determining when specific planets are at their most powerful. So what is an astrological talisman? It is a combination of astrological images, material components, and invocations of planetary spirits, all combined for a specific purpose. That purpose will draw influence from, or target, one particular astrological feature. A planet, a decan, a lunar mansion, or even a fixed star. And the talisman will be created at an auspicious moment. You will remember Josh Proto from the episode about planetary spirits and intelligences. He is an astrological magician with quite a bit of experience creating talismans. 
In fact, he's created more than 100. I asked Josh, what exactly is a talisman? Yeah, like, like the talismans themselves are the, uh, the, the fulfillment of the, of the petition. They're the fulfillment of a contract, one could potentially say. So the, the magician and the spirit and the angel, you know, they meet each other. Uh, you know, in a closed room, machine gun under the table, depending if what uh, sort of uh, accoutrements you have. Uh, and usually an agreement is reached, whether it's mutual or one-sided, that's, that's up to the nature of the situation. Uh, and part of that contract is, you know, changing the circumstances of fate, changing the circumstances of existence. Uh, and that can take, take forms, ultimately, you know, in our material world. You know, if I make a prayer or a petition for a better job or for my health to get better or something like that. You know, I, I hope it does happen. Uh, and proof of that uh, actuality of that contract can take the form of a talisman. And in some forms of magic, one would even say, depending on the quality of the magic or the quality of the petition, uh, an angel or a member of the celestial hierarchies can take one of their own servants or a part of their essence or, or something that they have more intimate control over and place that in the possession of the magician in the form of a talisman, in the form of a charged amulet, in the form of a familiar spirit. You know, there's, there's many different ways that this, I think, can happen. But specifically in astrological magic, and a lot that I practice, uh, the talismans can be these receptacle of planetary uh, energy and life force. As I mentioned a little earlier, most modern astrological magicians tend to lean pretty heavily on the Picatrix for figuring out what particular rules they are going to follow for selecting elections. However, there are many, many different sets of rules out there, and it's really up to each practitioner to figure out which rules to follow. So how can you pick which sources to use when working with astrological magic? Josh explains why he relies so heavily on both occult philosophy and the Picatrix. As practitioners, you know, we need to pick our sources of truth. We need to pick the things that we find are uh, very relatable and relevant to the kinds of magic we're looking to to replicate and to bring into the world. And I found, uh, and like after reading those and reflecting on those those messages, um, I found that was one of my was going to be one of my sources of truth. Uh, so whenever I'm thinking about uh, astrological magic, implementing something for myself, clients, friends, lovers, enemies. You know, I, I fall back onto, onto the, the characteristics and qualities and wisdom that uh, not just is inside the collection of works from Picatrix, but also a grip of Hyler. I once asked Josh how he keeps track of the particular rules he uses, and he slyly told me that he has a personal checklist of over 20 different rules that his elections need to satisfy. That can seem like a lot of rules for the beginning astrological magician, there are ways to simplify this list, but it takes a lot of practice. Here's your homework from this episode. Try going through the list of rules that Agrippa provides in Book 2, Chapters 29 and 30, and create your own list to start experimenting with. As you construct your set of rules to experiment with, just remember Agrippa's important advice. Always pay attention to the moon in all of your operations. Though occult philosophy never explicitly lays out ritual instructions for consecrating talismans, it has plenty to say about their physical construction. Beginning with Book 2, Chapter 35, Agrippa discusses both the materials and images used for talisman construction. He tells us, Thus, magicians not only mix and apply natural things, but also images, sigils, rings, mirrors, and other suitable instruments. Agrippa explains that when this is done during a suitable election, a certain celestial enlightenment is captured, and they can secure something wonderful. This celestial enlightenment, in fact, comes from the astrological election for the creation of the talisman. In my opinion, it is here in chapter 35 that all of the lists of planetary rulerships over various herbs, stones, and animals in book one finally start to make sense. When you are planning your own talismans, you can use the catalog of book one to determine which materials to use. But 
while you should make an effort to find good corresponding materials for your talismans, you don't have to be too strict about it, because Agrippa assures us that the stars will imprint wonderful virtues even in less suitable materials. In addition to the astrological election and proper corresponding materials, astrological talismans also involve images. Agrippa spends many chapters on these images with plenty of excellent examples for each of the planets and other astrological features. These are worth reading and studying. In fact, in many of these examples, he even gives specific elections to look for. Understanding the role of images in talisman creation does require us to examine once more the relationship between divine light and the imagination. Now that we have reached this point in our studies of occult philosophy, it might be a good idea to go back and give the episode on divine light and the senses another listen. However, I also asked Jay Swafford to explain the role of images in astrological magic, and... Due to his brilliance, he was able to give me a description much shorter and more to the point than anything that either Agrippa or I could come up with. So the images, um, the image is kind of, I don't know, one way to talk about it. One way to think about it is maybe as like the the programming to use a, a computer term uh, for it. So one of the examples that they give in the Picatrix is that if you're making a talisman to to get free of something or to escape from something, then you could make the image of a bird in flight. And so the image kind of informs the the talisman and and gives it a sort of direction. Also, in the process of empowering the talisman, I personally uh, use visualization to do that. And so visualizing the image, in such a way that it is, you know, embodying the purpose of the talisman adds to its consecration. So in the example of making a talisman to get free of something, you know, visualizing a bird in flight or taking off or escaping from a cage, something similar, that image would be used in an active way to consecrate the, the talisman. And the image would, in theory, also be on the talisman itself. And so you'd have a picture of like a bird coming out of a cage. All right, I know that once again, this episode is packed with a lot of information. There's plenty to take in and plenty of homework to do afterwards. You're going to want to spend a lot of time with book two of Agrippa. Maybe go back and explore some of book one and take a look at those lists of correspondences and the chapters on divine light and the senses and how all of that stuff works. Certainly, these few podcast episodes are not enough to cover the entire topic of astrological magic. In fact, once you begin working with this particular technique, you will quickly discover that there is a richness and depth to it that will take a lifetime to master. Anyhow, enjoy. Did you ever feel it's the little things which somehow throw your life into a tailspin before you realize it? There will, of course, be future episodes about astrological magic. Maybe no more in this Agrippa series, but uh, look for more interviews with astrologers and magicians in the future where we dive into specifics. Okay, in our next episode, we will be discussing the Kabbalah of occult philosophy, and we will be featuring an expert that you'll all be very excited to hear from. Thanks to Tuoma Sipola for his translation of the first emblem from Michael Meyer's Atlantia Fugiens that I used in the opening. Tuomo and others in the Languages and Linguistics channel in the Hermetic House of Life Discord server all helped me figure out the mystery of this poem. In fact, the mystery is a good one. I picked that particular poem because there is a reference to Agrippa. In fact, there's a reference to both Caesar and Agrippa, but once again, as with Pliny, this is is a reference to Marcus Vespanius Agrippa and not our beloved Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. Meyer's poem is interesting. It is about a desire for Borneus to be born naturally under a fixed star and not be a caesarean section, which would be the reference to Caesar, or a breech birth, which is the reference to Agrippa. 
Thanks also to Josh Proto and Jay Swafford for their help in explaining and untangling the numerous mysteries of astrological magic and electional astrology. And thanks also to Eric Perdue, who helped quite a bit with this episode behind the scenes, even if I didn't use any of his audio clips. There are just two episodes left after this in our exploration of Agrippa's occult philosophy. My Patreon supporters will be receiving each episode a week before the rest of the world, along with bonus materials such as full interviews, a glimpse at works in progress, and the opportunity to suggest further topics for developing this Agrippa deep dive. If you enjoy these episodes and want to help support their development, you can help out by sharing this podcast with a friend. Let your weird wizard buddies and witch pals know that we have been on this journey and invite them to join us. And if you want to contribute monetarily, you can always go to arnamancy.com slash support and find a number of options. Until next time, keep reading books, keep being weird, and keep doing magic. This has been another episode of the Arnamancy Podcast. Thank you for joining me. I have been your host, Reverend Eric. You can find Arnamancy online at arnamancy.com, and you can subscribe to this podcast anywhere podcasts are found. If you like what you hear, please consider supporting the Arnamancy Project for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash arnamancy. 